Madam President, uh, I start by congratulating Rupert Cunningham on his opening speech. He's managed to make most of my speech for me, uh, which saves a lot of trouble, and he got most of it right. Uh, and I also, <laughs> uh, I also congratulate Ben Navarro on the vigour of his presentation. I suspect he bears a famous political name. I don't know if that's right or not. It may embarrass him. I don't know. But if he does, uh, don't be embarrassed about it. Uh, can I just simply say this, that I was very interested in what he said. What he seems to, and uh, in the way he spoke, was to concede the first part of the motion. He started off straight away by saying, I'm not going to talk about the 1970s. I'm just going to talk about what happened afterwards. And as Rupert has already made clear, it's the first part of the motion. And I will talk about that, because unlike Rupert, I was there. <laughs> uh, and I was there in the 60s. And so I remember what happened to Britain at that time. And what I think was unacceptable in the otherwise very vigorous presentation he made was that we seemed to go completely through the years of Blair and Brown and claim that every problem that Britain now has is because of Thatcher. <laughs> uh, well, I'm... <laughs> of course, I'm perfectly prepared to write off Blair and Brown. I have no problem <laughs> about that at all, and I welcome that approach uh, from the opposition. Can I say I am embarrassed to be here? Because when I was Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, a lot of people got a bit nervous about getting too close to me in case it was a bit dangerous. Uh, and we did have a few problems. But people then thought, well, actually, if you're close to Tom King, he has uh, lots of protection, there'll be lots of security. And he didn't always work. On one occasion, I was going from a meeting in my office in Stormont Castle down into the middle of Belfast, my police escort, and we came roaring round a corner. And suddenly, the road was blocked, big diversion notice. Uh, young RUC constable rushed up to the car and said, sorry, nobody can go through. Large, unexploded bomb, about to go off at any minute. Everybody's got to go around. He looked into the car and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. I didn't realise it was you. Carry on right through. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, have this proposition, and as it said, there are two propositions. And I was there. I actually am here now because I ran a printing plant. I was the manager of a printing plant in Bristol in the 1960s. Nine trade unions trying to keep the show on the road, seeing orders for printing going overseas because Britain no longer was efficient or competitive. I saw the problems that were coming out of the abuse of trade union power. And I saw how Britain was, did, did do something about it, was going down the pan pretty quickly. And we moved on. I got, came to Parliament in 1970. And I'll talk about the 1970s. And I'll start, just to show I'm not biased, I'll bring a couple of Oxford witnesses to my assistance. The first one, Sir Nicholas Henderson, Hartford College, one of our most distinguished ambassadors. Uh, he uh, was our ambassador in Bonn, he was our ambassador in Paris, he was our ambassador in Washington, very splendidly during the Falklands War, where he played a blinder. But when he was then thinking he was retiring from Paris, he wrote a farewell dispatch to the Foreign Secretary of the day, actually Mr David Owen, in the Labour government as it was. And this was March 1979, two months before the election. And what did he say? He entitled it, Britain's decline, its causes and consequences. He said in it, we talk of ourselves without shame as one of the less prosperous countries of Europe. In France, Britain is the model that people say not to follow if economic disaster is to be avoided. And I'm sorry we haven't got Jason Cowley here today, who's the editor of The New Statesman, who was also due to come recent edition of the New Statesman, quoted a former chairman of the Oxford University Labour Party. And what did he say? He was here in the 70s as an undergraduate, and he said in the 70s, you did get some sense that Britain was going into permanent decay. And uh, he said that uh, he agreed with that. 
and the humiliation of that time when a British Chancellor of the Exchequer goes straight from a Labour Party conference in 1976, has to leave early, has to rush and catch a plane, to fly to uh, Washington, to beg for a loan from the International Monetary Fund. What sort of government was that and what sort of situation was that country in? And of course I talked about the abuse of trade union power. Trade union abuse of power destroyed three prime ministers in this country. Harold Wilson knew there needed to be changes. He couldn't get it through his own cabinet. Ted Heath was destroyed, the Conservative government, February 1974, collapsed, as uh, already Rupert has said, collapsed into a three-day week, uh, an election for who governs Britain. And the answer was that the Conservatives didn't. They lost, and the trade union and the National Union of Mine Workers one. And somebody took a poll at that time and said, who's the most powerful person in Britain? You've got that poll now. You might have a chance. If there's a prime minister, whoever it might be. The answer that the nation gave was Jack Jones, General Secretary of the Transport and General Workers Union. That's how people thought the power lay. And of course, poor Jim Keller, whose government also collapsed in total confusion, as uh, Rupert said. We had a series of strikes in that period, uh, right up to the election, rubbish in the streets, but, uh, dead not being buried. And the final humiliation, it really was, the light of the vote of confidence that he lost that meant there was going to be a general election. Not only was uh, strikes outside, but the catering staff in the House of Commons went on strike as well. <laughs> I mean, that's a real humiliation at the end of the day. And, I remember here in Oxford talking to Michael Edwards, who was then running what was a great car company, the British Leyland. And he said the first year he was the chief executive, there wasn't a single day in that year when one or other of his factories weren't on strike. And if you wonder why, we went from being one of the great car producing countries of the world to a humiliating lower patch. And uh, we lost out there. And, uh, that was our inheritance. And we came into government in the election in 1979. And we didn't actually do much about the unions at that time because we weren't in a very powerful position uh, and we needed to be sure. But the problems that uh, Ben talked about, 27% inflation, every other industry coming in with claims for 20, 25%. Yes? Inflation was higher when she left office. That is not actually correct, and I'll take you through that. But that, that was the situation. We had to face a situation in which prices were rocketing up, wage claims were rocketing up, and that's what was destroying our economy, and that was what was destroying our industry at that time. And I was there. And I was there. <laughs> and, and I had to, and this business, because we heard it today about turning our back on the big cities. I was the minister for Merseyside. Margaret Thatcher sent me to Merseyside in 1983 to try and bring some help and to try and sort it out. And I was Secretary of State for Employment as we steadily got unemployment down, which had been growing through all the years before, from the, Labour, from the mess of the 70s through under the Labour government as that unemployment went on and on and on. And we couldn't turn it round on day one and we couldn't turn it round on day two. But my goodness, we then turned it round and got the economy going again. <laughs> and then, but she wasn't, with some of the tough decisions we had to take, she wasn't very popular. And we didn't have the strength to take action at that time. <coughs> and then she had an extraordinary event happen. And a fascist dictator, General Galatieri in Argentina, invaded and seized the Falklands. And all her cabinet and everybody else said, well, we can't do anything about that. It's 8,000 miles away. We'll never be able to get it back. But her leadership, her determination, and the courage and supreme ability of the task force we sent saved the Falklands, liberated them from a fascist dictator that was otherwise murdering his own people and restored them as they were as a British possession. Uh, and that has never been forgotten by anybody in the Falklands. 
And that changed the public mood in a most extraordinary way. Her popularity soared. We then had an election, and she had a majority of 144. Not that British people thought she was a disaster. That's the biggest majority that anybody had had for 40 years. And that gave her the strength then to tackle the really difficult issue. And uh, we then prepared for what we knew was the challenge that was going to come. And it did. And Mr. Scargill thought he'd repeat what he'd done to Ted Heath and bring the country to a standstill and win again. And it was very tough. And it was a very bad and difficult and sad and tragic year. And a lot of families and a lot of mining families suffered a lot. And a lot of the miners who wanted to go to work were intimidated by flying pickets who stopped them and were beating them up and were threatening their families and making sure that nobody went to work. But fortunately, the other unions wouldn't support Scargill. The other unions didn't come out uh, on strike. Uh, and uh, the power stations kept going. And we survived. And Scargill was beaten. The miners were able to go back to work. Uh, and we were able to get the country back on the road again. And I brought in the legislation. I was responsible for the legislation that said, in future, no union member will be allowed to go in on strike just because he's been dragged into a car park uh, and a lot of intimidation and told all our brothers and put your hands up that everybody for a strike to be legal they had to write to a secret postal ballot uh, and that is why you look at the figures that have been quoted why the strikes came right down and if I just make uh, this further point it wasn't just at home it was her standing overseas that transformed it her friendship with President Gorbachev her relationship with President Reagan Anybody who goes to Poland or Czech Republic or Hungary and looks now and says, what do you think of the Iron Lady? And they'll tell you that they believe that they, she saved them and she gave the leadership that saw the end of the Cold War, the end of the Berlin Wall and all that awful situation that existed. And if I just say, and I, I, I understand I heard the bell very clearly. <laughs> I thought it was closing time for a moment, but anyway. <laughs> I'm sure somebody else will tell me if that's right. I just, I just add this. I was involved uh, in the first Gulf War when Kuwait was invaded, and Margaret Thatcher gave the lead to the whole world. Some of you may remember the phrase, no time to wobble now, George, that she addressed to George Bush. And you come to the Gulf, you meet any of the countries in the Gulf, and they say, who really saved us at that time? And you'll say there was no doubt that it was Margaret Thatcher. And Perhaps I could uh, just end with the final endorsement of the image that she had, perhaps almost as well as anywhere in the United States who thought she was a, an outstanding leader that they recognized. And she said that uh, uh, Walter Cronkite, who was the CBS, famous CBS anchor man, the most respected man in America, they said, at the end of his interview with her, he turned to her and said, Mrs. Thatcher, will you accept my nomination for presidency of the United States. Uh, well, she didn't, but uh, I just, I just add one last line, if I'm allowed to. <laughs> that, uh, I just think that we have here a young girl, chemistry undergraduate, who came to Oxford from living over the shop in a corner shop in Grantham, and went on to become the best known prime minister in this country since Winston Churchill. She made this country proud again. And that is something Oxford hasn't always recognized that. I hope tonight, with your vote, you will recognize that whatever your differences, she was an outstanding leader, and that should be recognized.